Well, g'day guys, and welcome back to the Bush TV. Well, welcome to the Q and A. Uh, and I thought I'd do this while I'm situated in this spot. There, I'm making a video as we speak uh, in this spot. It's a pristine spot. The birds, the river, everything's absolutely perfect. So, why not take the opportunity to actually do the Q and A on site, like on a camp spot? So, here we are. I'm going to do the Q and A. As some of you might know. Uh, I put up a Q&A on Facebook, Instagram, and on the community tab in YouTube quite some time ago. Uh, I held on to it for quite a while just so I could get as many questions out there as I could from you guys. So here we are, situated in this absolutely pristine spot, which is another sort of secret location. Um, one of my subscribers told me about this, and I am going to keep it a, a bit quiet. Uh, the way it is, it's pristine. It does look a little bit preserved, and people have been here, but it's definitely hard to find, and it's actually not too far away. So, anyway, we're here. So, first things first, I'd like to thank everybody who subscribes to this channel, because you guys are what makes me keep the content rolling out. So, by your subscriptions, comments, and feedback, that gives me the incentive to make these videos. This video that I'm making as we speak, has a different approach. It uh, lives up to its name of Bush TV, which means Wikipedia or whatever it is is described Bush TV as campfire. Well, I'm not gonna make a video of the campfire, but I am gonna make it of the campsite and the birds and everything. So you'll have to wait and see what this video is about when it does come out. Also, I'd like to thank everybody who bought a stubby holder and who's bought stickers as well. The link is in the description of the video and on the channel and on Facebook if you would like to purchase one. Okay, so let's get into this q and I've had to, um, obviously there's no service here, so what I've done is I've downloaded a Word doc on my phone. So let's get into this. Like this is, there's quite a number of questions, so bear with me and I uh, do appreciate everybody watching this whole video right through because um, you guys are rocking. So yeah, all right, so okay, the first question I have on here I won't say who they're from, okay? I'll just answer the questions. Okay. I would like to know where you would camp if, if it was your last camp ever. Now, there's so many good spots. Like, seriously, there is. I reckon one of my favorite spots would have to be up in the, in the limestone area. I love the Davies Plain Hut, AKA Stockman's Hut. I love that area there. It's lacking a bit of river where in back towards limestone, you know, you can sort of kick back on the limestone creek. It's beautiful. That is one of my favorite spots. The second favorite spot I would have to say would be Upper Jamison Hut, right on the Jamison River. And then to top it, to be quite honest, this is not a bad spot, but I mean, the river's behind me there. It's not greatly accessible, but um, yeah. So I would say limestone, Jamison Hut. No doubt, that would be my two favourite spots. I would definitely go. I would work in Jamison Hut. There's no doubt about it. What would be some items or mods would you recommend when heading out to the bush? No, I always bring this. This is an emergency beacon. In remote country like this, where there's no service, if I get bitten by a snake out there, I'll pull out the, pull out the emergency beacon. If I can get it out. Maybe I'm dead by now. Okay, this is what I use. I use one of these, okay? I don't leave home about this. It's 100% important that you're prepared in high country. So all I do is break the seal, pull the antenna, and this activates. It's a satellite one, so it's a GPS equipped one. If something happens, and I pull the pin, they'll come and they'll get me and it'll save my life. I reckon the starters, if you're gonna buy something I would put a two inch lift in with 33s of a set of muddies. Like, depending on where you go, like you can get around with all terrains. Also, if you got the money, throw a winch on the car. There's no doubt about it. You don't have to go cosmetic and tint the windows and all that sort of thing. You want to be able to go places, right? So that two inch lift, like I said, would get you that little bit more clearance. It's not a lot. And like a bag with recovery gear, a snatch, snatch block, and things like that. And also, if you are going out and it's going to be, you know, you think it's going to be a bit much, always a second vehicle. That's my definite, definite recommendation. Have you explored more than this country by 4x4, like the Vic High Country? That's a question. Okay. A couple of places up interstate. Not many, though. Seriously, I haven't. So I've lived down here most of my life. I did live in Queensland for a couple of years. 
uh, with my parents as a child, so obviously I couldn't obviously get out and explore that by myself. So no, I have, like I said, visited other parts of Victoria in the bush, but um, pre preferably at the moment and throughout the years, it has been the Victorian high country. Okay, a lot of people have been asking me this question, I get it all the time, and that's tag-alongs. Um, will I do a tag-along? Well, maybe, I probably will, uh, to a certain amount of people, and no doubt probably midweek rather than weekend. Um, also, I won't be videoing a tag-along, and if I do, it'll be bare minimum. Obviously, videos take up a lot of time and take me about 10 times longer to get from A to B than what it would for you guys just to drive, get up and go. So, okay, another one. I probably just commented on this one before. Favourite place in the high country. Well, there's no doubt about it that I like high elevation, right? And I really, really do. I love snow gums, even if there's no river. Uh, there's, there's several favourite pl places I just named before. Jamison Hut, Limestone Creek, we got all over the top end of the bluff, helicopter spur. I remember camping back there in the 90s, it was beautiful, seeing the stars and the shooting stars. Uh, there's heaps of places, there's so many places I could name. Uh, Wanagata is another one, I'm really, there's a big crow just flying past, look at that, I'm really, you guys can't see that. Uh, Wanagata is another one, I really like it down in the valley there. Um, it's secluded and it is obviously the most remote part of the Victorian high country. And the camps along the Wanagata River are pristine. Okay, how many spare parts and what are they that I travel with? Well, firstly, I have done wheel bearings in the bush before. They've seized. So I do carry a wheel bearing kit. Uh, I used to carry two, but took a bit much space up. One's enough. Um, fan belts, uh, hoses, heater hose, as you can see, you've seen on the other trips. That I've had problems before with heater hoses. I carry a multimeter that's in the glove box. I carry like, you know, connectors and all that type of stuff to do with the electrical part of the vehicle. You know, if something might go wrong, I carry wire. Uh, I carry fence wire, lots of cable ties. Uh, fence wire, I carry a length of about probably uh, 800 long because it always comes in handy. Just say you break an exhaust mount that's hanging down. You can't cable tie that up. So you use, I'd use fence wire just to strap it up. I carry extra ratchet straps just in case something lets go underneath. You can ratchet strap it back. Um, all sorts of different st stuff. I've got a toolbox full of like tools in there. Um, thankfully, I don't have to use them all the time. So uh, yeah, there's little bits and pieces that always come in handy. How do you think the average dual cab would handle in the high country? With say just a two inch lift and 30 ones also a locker if necessary i think it'll be fine like it depends where you go like tracks are always changing you know like you could go in one place and then the next year it's completely different and erode it out if you're going to travel around and you're a little bit wary i reckon definitely take a second vehicle and um obviously a winch snatch straps and things like that the recovery so but i think it'll be fine there's a lot of places you can get a camper trailer in as well, and there's a lot of places you can't. Crow's Hut, for example. I was in there one year, invited someone along, they took a camper trailer, they invited their mate along with them at the last minute, and they couldn't get out that track at the top. It took us about three hours to winch two camper trailers out. So, yeah, look, you can, obviously, common sense plays a big part in it. You can see a track, you go, well, I'm not going to go down that, because I might not be able to turn around. Handy for me, I've, I've flown my drone down several tracks rather than walk it, just to check those tracks out. So uh, if you're still unsure, I've walked several tracks as well just to check them out too, but I think you'll be fine. Another one's for almost the same type of question. I'd love to do some exploring in the high country, but I have a fairly stock Triton on all terrains, no snorkel or winch. Are there some places I can check out or would you recommend a winch? lift bigger tyres, etc. Look, I reckon there's plenty of places you can check out. You can get all the way up to the Howard Road through the Cola. Um, when, it, when it comes to river crossings, that's when you're going to have trouble. Um, that's unless the rivers are low, like, you know, or another vehicle will be handy. So uh, you can get all the way through Mansfield, all the way to Sheepyard Flat, Fry's Hut. Uh, I wouldn't risk going down into Jamison Hut in that. And obviously you can get down and you probably cross the river, but getting back out is going to be the problem. 
Um, you can do all the way up, you can do, you'd be able to do refrigerator gap track, the whole bluff range, no problem at all. Stay in Lovick, stay in Bluff Hut, go all the way through. Over the other side of King Billy, these days has been a bit of an issue. So I probably wouldn't do that. I'd probably plan a separate trip and come up through La Cola and head up that way. Uh, Wanagata, another one that might be a bit of an issue. If you had a couple of vehicles, you could probably survive it. And uh, if you get stuck, they can just pull you through or pull you out. The steep sections like Hearn Spur Track is where you might have a bit of problems. Um, lowering tyre pressure might help you, but uh, yeah, look, it's it's one of those things. Um, tyres, like I said before, are important, you know. A good set of muddies, even if they're 31s, they're going to get you a lot further than a set of all-terrains, especially in the wet. What made me start exploring the outdoors? I've just always liked it. My father took me camping as a kid. I was probably about bloody three years old, you know. I remember it. I don't remember a lot of things then. I remember that. It was bloody freezing. I know that, right? And I think it was in Warrialic or somewhere. It took me fishing. It was bloody freezing. Anyways, that wasn't a bad experience. I just loved the bush. I grew up sort of around a bush. And this, just, I love it. I love the peace. I love the birds and things. So, And then I just like to see different places and explore the high country. Like, there's nothing better to me than kicking back and relaxing around the fire and, you know, listening to those birds and that river in the background. So... It, I've just got the bug, I'd say. That's what it is. We can't let the fire go out, so just have to top that up. All right, so let's get back into this. I think one was from Luca. Uh, Luca, I remember meeting you up the top there in the Hout High Plains. Uh, when I met you, he told me a story that happened at the bottom end of Blue Rag Range, Wongongara River, 20 odd years ago. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if I can really go into that, but um, there was a trip we went on and we invited someone along. They took, they had an alternator problem in their vehicle. And we did, it was a big trip too. We did all the way in through Mansfield, Wanagata, um, then up over the top to Blue Rag, to the Wongangara River. Uh, it was a challenge. Like we did, we did basalt knob and all that with this vehicle, constantly having to snatch it, the roll started. And it was, it was like, no words can explain, or maybe I can't be too polite, on what the feeling was and the frustration of that along on the trip for days as well, several days. Um, there was a confrontation at the bottom of uh, Wongangara, down at the Wongangara River there. I won't mention names. And uh, it turned a bit nasty. I had my son with me on that day, so um, I had to go. I had to put my son in the car and leave the two people down the bottom. And I went up to the Langy Spur hut where I met you, Luca. Um, stayed there, the hut was a whole lot different back then. It was good, it had a fireplace in it too. So me and him, my son, got the fire going and yeah, kicked back for the night and then drove home through Bright. So, and about a week later, I went back to Blue Rag Range and recovered the Nissan. So it was a Nissan GU, I think it was, one of the real old ones. Uh, it was just on the other side of the summit, going down towards the Wongongara River, broken down. Um, I had to snatch it up all the way with my vehicle, all the way up over the summit, all those rock steps, the whole lot. I don't even know how I did it. The car was dead weight, it wasn't running. Anyway, we got it over the top, and then I blew a heater hose at the top of Blue Rag on the, on the High Plains Road. Pulled over, replaced the heater hose, had just enough water to fill up the radiator, drove down the High Plains Road, fill up a few more bottles, because this was only a day trip, we weren't even staying in there the night, just to get this vehicle. So I filled up a few bottles, put it in, off we went, back home. And the guy only gave me 20 bucks at the end of the night, 20 bucks, to get his vehicle home, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, I must have just done it for love, or it must have looked like I did anyway. I mean, I didn't really care, but, 20 bucks. Might as well give me nothing. Anyway, so yeah, uh, I won't go into what happened down the bottom, but um, it didn't really involve didn't involve me, so that was the main thing. But yeah, I did I did get out of there with my son. He was only about three years old or four years old at the time, so I didn't want him experience any any confrontation down in the middle of the bush, like in no man's land. So that's what happened down there. So anyways. What is the best meal you've cooked while camping and what is one you'll never cook again? Well, I reckon, look, I can't, you can't go past, there's two, I reckon. I've done awesome roast pork 
and that's for a group in the camp oven. I took a group of people up there. Um, they paid for the whole trip. I just hosted it pretty much. And we did it, did the whole Mansfield thing. We stayed at Lovick's. I cooked a nice big roast pork with veggies and everything in the horse yard. Now, that was a real top meal. And I've done it several times, roast pork. I love it. And I also love me roast lamb. I love it. It's beautiful. It's making me hungry, right? They don't have roast lamb tonight either. I've only got, um, I've got a baked potato with coleslaw and things and just some snags and stuff. It's pretty basic. Uh, and one I will never cook again. I don't think there, I honestly don't think there's something I'll never cook again. Like, pretty much everything I do cook in the high country, it's look of routine. I sort of just cook these things all the time, so, um, yeah, I can't say there's anything that I wouldn't cook again. There's probably, no, I've never had really a bad experience with it, so, not that off the top of my head anyway, so I don't think there's anything. Will you try to keep the truck going as time goes on or will I upgrade the 80 series? I want to keep it. I don't want to get rid of the 80. I've had the 80 for a very long time. Uh, even before I had 80 series at Land Cruiser, uh, I was going away with a mate of mine who had one and I've always, I just fell in love with those things straight away. I can't see the point. I wouldn't even upgrade to a, a 105, even though the 105 is pretty much the same thing. A um, couple of different mods, obviously, in the engine. It's got a different manifold, and it doesn't have, like, a distributor and stuff. But um, if I did upgrade it, uh, I am thinking of a rebuild with a turbo. So uh, it's getting custom bar work in October. Um, yeah, so more to the point that I will keep the 80 series and probably upgrade it as time goes on. Uh, it's, a, it's a very basic sort of setup inside the vehicle, so... I don't have all the drawers and all the bells and whistles and you know, I don't have a, I don't have a camp, uh, what do you call it, a travel buddy or anything like that in there at the moment. Uh, it's pretty basic and it does the job. The next one's about economy, like you know, fuel usage and stuff. Lots of people do ask me, this is a petrol, a lot of people thought, thought it was a diesel. Uh, it's a petrol and at the moment it's on gas which is going to be ripped out. The gas has given me nothing but trouble over the years, like even on this trip. I went up and got wood, flicked it over back to gas, nothing. There's no gas. I'm like, what's going on? So I got back down near the camp, lifted the bonnet. Corrugations have loosened off a little, a little wire, one of those stupid little lock-off solenoid. And it's given me nothing but grief since I bought the car. Uh, if, I had go back, if I had to go back in time, uh, I would have bought a diesel. A 1HD FT or whatever they are. I would have bought the best one. No doubt about it back then, so. But it is what it is, and it's done the job. It's got, what, 440,000 Ks on the clock. Uh, it did a head gasket back in 2007. That's fixed. That has never given me a problem since. The only issue is the gas. So that gas is gonna come out uh, once the rebuild gets done on the motor, and then I'll put like a Brown Davis drop tank or something in there, long range tank as well. So get rid of this gas, because it's nothing but problems. So economy-wise, like, it's all different. Obviously, it's not highway driving. Uh, it's like, it can change in, overnight as well. We could get up the top and then it could snow. We could get stuck for hours. So it's hard to really judge how much fuel I'm using. Uh, some days it's easy. Some days I come back with like, you know, a quarter of a tank of gas and a quarter of a half a tank of petrol, you know. Uh, other trips, I, I use 300 bucks worth like, and two jerry cans. It depends where you're going, how long you're out for. Okay, I'm just watching that smoke doesn't come in, cop me in the eyes. Okie doke. Do you ever feel unsafe or moved camp because something's just not quite right? Okay, funny enough that that question's asked. Oh, I was camped in Wanangatta. Yep, Wanangatta. The place of mysteries, right? Uh, with a mate of mine, I had two of my kids with me. This was back in around 2000 and... Oh, maybe eight or nine, somewhere around there. Anyways, the camp that we usually camp in was taken, right? So we usually come into Wanagata, go uh, down Zega, in, into Wanagata, past the station, and then on the left, there's a few good camps along the river. Uh, the, like I said, the camp we came across was taken. So we just went further in a little bit. There's another spot that's sort of up a bit. It wasn't as good as that spot. So 
camped there the night and noticed on the way through when we seen the ca original camp we were going to camp at, there was this big 44 gallon drum, plastic one, blue one, sitting in the middle of the camp. I didn't think anything of it, right? Anyway, we're camped over there, probably, I don't know, what, what have we been, 500, 400, 500 metres away from that one. Next day, we went for a bit of a walk and they'd broken camp. So me and my mate thought, well, let's go, let's get the spot. So we packed up, it was just a quick pack up, went over there and uh, camped there. So it was good. And then in the middle of the night, oh, before the night came, I went, I had to go to the, you know, I had to go and use the, uh, the tree for a toilet. So I walked off and did that and spotted the blue drum in all the tea trees stashed away. And I'm like, well, what's going on here? So I called my mate over, we opened it all up. There was like empty bullets and there was live bullets in the bottom and all sorts of different pieces. To me, it just looked like a food dump. Like someone had, you know, dropped this big drum full of like whatever, so they could hike in or hunt or whatever, and it's there for whenever they need it, rather than take it in by vehicle. And didn't really think much of it, just left it there. And um, middle of the night came along. Now, I didn't hear it, but my mate heard it. He was in his swag, my two kids were in the tent and I was in my swag, fast asleep. My mate kept getting bitten by something inside his swag all night, so it kept him awake. Now, it ended up being a bull ant. In the morning, he seen it in the swag and it was half squashed and things. But anyways, two people came into our camp at four o'clock in the morning with two little torches and they're looking around our camp everywhere and they went to that blue barrel. So the next morning, we sort of freaked out. Well, like, what's going on? This is a bit weird. Like, what, what's happened here? We pretty much packed up and just got out of there. Uh, I think I even reported it to the police when we got home because it was a bit suspicious, like told the police where the drum was and about who came. We didn't know who they were that came into camp at four o'clock in the morning, but there was two adults, males. So who knows what they were looking for? They didn't take anything from the camp. Um, they didn't go through the vehicles or nothing like that. They were just snooping around and then looking around for that barrel. So that was one time that I felt real strange. I don't think there's been any other times besides wild dogs. Uh, I've had hunters' dogs just turn up in camp uh, randomly. Just we're sitting around a fire at 10 o'clock at night. Next minute, this dog turns up in the camp and just sits next to the fire and it's got a collar on with a beacon. About half an hour later, people turn up and they don't even really talk to you. They just take the dog and they go. So yeah, uh, nothing real bad. I have met button man. People, you know, are a bit freaked out about this so-called button man in the high country, but I have met button man up at Bluff Hut uh, back in, oh, I think it was 2007 or something around there and had like a 45 minute conversation with him. He's actually not a bad bloke. So yeah, he was, he's obviously some funny ways. He was stalking a pack of do wild dogs in the Jamison Valley and he was telling me about that. So beside that, like he was just a normal person. He was all right, he was polite. He didn't swear or anything like that. He was, he was quite polite. Quite a good guy, so no problem. So just like in saying all that, uh, you guys know I do a lot of solo camping and you just do get used to it. I'd, back in the day, I wouldn't even have dreamt of doing this sort of thing solo. Um, I did do it solo back in 2006 once on my own up in Jamison Hut and I'd never done it before and it felt quite strange actually to be out there on your own. Uh, you feel a little bit vulnerable, but even though there's no one, it's still got that level of anxiety around it. Uh, these days, obviously, I've, I've done it quite a lot. So to me, it doesn't bother me. If I do hear a funny noise out there and it's night, I'm like, I am a bit weary about it. I'm like, what's that? You know, but at the end of the day, there's pretty much nothing out here, you know, besides wildlife and wild dogs and things like that. So never really had a bad encounter with them. Um, Last couple of trips I did, one at uh, Tarbeville had a wild cat. Like it was right like there, it came into camp and just, I don't know whether it was just stupid or what, but when I noticed it, it took off. So yeah, but yeah, once you, you know, you get used to solo trips like this, nothing really bothers me. I did come out at Shaw's Creek Lagoon from McMichael's hut on one of my trips. I was setting up the camera uh, just next to the car, just to do the exit, so the outro of the video. 
and a gunshot went off, like, and it was seriously, I reckon, from where I was standing, where, from where they shot it from, and I couldn't see the person, I reckon they were only around 200 metres away. I, like, actually almost jumped out of his skin. So, yeah, that was quite hairy there, but I mean, it was in the middle of a sort of morning, late morning, when that happened. Uh, I couldn't see anyone. I did, I freaked out a bit. I went to the car and held the horn down for about three seconds just to let people know in the area that there's someone there. So uh, that was a bit of a close encounter. Who knows where they were shooting and what at? And I don't even think you're meant to be shooting in that area. Do you or will you get out and about for other areas for content? Uh, yeah, I will actually. I've um, got lots of lots of things planned for interstate stuff. Um, whether I'm going to get around to doing it or not, uh, we'll see what happens. And it's, it's not just for content. I sort of want to get out and have a look around in those areas. Uh, there's some good country out there, so I am keen to explore it. How old were you on your first camping trip? And where was it? Uh, well, I explained it before. I was about four years old, and I think it was in Yarra Junction in Victoria with my father. He was fishing. Um, I'm pretty sure it was on the Little Yarra or somewhere like that. And yeah, I was about four years old. So that was the first camping trip. And I can remember parts of it that it was cold. So it imprinted into my memory. Trust me, that did. Did your parents go camping? Yeah, well, not my mother that I can remember, but my father, yes. And he's the main reason. He's the one that got me into it when I was a young kid, like, you know, in and around growing up seven or eight years old, we, him and I used to go fishing up at Jerusalem Creek all the time. So we were camping out uh, up there on the Elden Weir. It was really good fun. We'd go weekly. So, yeah, that's where I probably got the bug from. How are you finding the Yokohamas? I've been torn between Faulkner's Maxes and Yokies. So I'd be keen to hear. I reckon they're good. The, yeah, they're good, the Geolanders. I've not had a problem with them they seriously obviously kick ass on the ones i had and so far so good i haven't had a problem uh they sort of tear through everything that i'm going through even if it's a bit rugged just drop me tire pressure up i go no problem at all so no complaints what what are your five favorite tracks there's a lot there's a lot okay um and it changes too. They grade things, which really annoys me. But I mean, they have to sort of do that grading so they can get access because of fire management and things like that. So I understand why. Okay, I would have to say one of them would be Butcher Country. There's no doubt about Butcher Country track is awesome. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Billy Goats would have to be up there as well. But I think Billy Goats is a little bit overrated, but it's a good track. Like, I think it's great. That's the shortest, steepest incline or whatever it is, or something like that in the Victorian high country. So uh, another one would have to be, I used to love Monument Track back in the day, but they've, that's a totally different ball game these days. Speculation Track's always good as well. It's not too rough and it goes into a place where there's no man's land. Also love the Nunningong area. There's some good tracks up there and the country is just a little bit different. And obviously Davies Plains up in out of Corion and all that way, all the way through there. That's one of my favourite areas as well. What advice do I have for first timers going to the Vic High Country? And what tracks for novice? If I was a first timer, I'd head, I'd head straight at the Sheepyard Flat and check out all that area where Bluff Hut is, Lovick's Hut, and I'd do the circuit. I'd do maybe the circuit road to Craig's Hut. You've got Bindere Falls. I reckon Bindere Hut, you could have a crack at getting out up the Jeep track on the other side. In good weather, I reckon you'd be right. So there's a lot of spots in and around that area that are pretty good for a novice person. You'd have no problem, so. And good camping spots on rivers and things and huts and high elevation, all that sort of thing. So I think it's like, it's a good part of the country. Which tracks in the Victorian high country are okay for an off-road camper trailer or would a base camp be better? Uh, I would probably base camp somewhere central and then do good day runs. I mean, it's okay, but like, track conditions can change. Like I do say, I've said it all the time, 
even here, like where I am right now, like I said before, you, you'd be able to get down here with a camper trailer and you'd be able to get back out. I reckon getting out, you'd have to pick your line and you'd have to be smart at it. It's not, it's not quite as easy as you think getting out. Um, but if it rains, obviously if it rains here, you'd probably be pulling the winch out a couple of times to get out up there. So, you know, if you want to do that, that's the choice that you have to make before you sort of head down tracks. But um, I reckon if you've got a camper trailer, you can tour a lot of the high country, you know, there's, there's places you can go. But if you want to explore one area, there's no harm in base camping, that's for sure. Set up a base camp, go out for day runs, it's good fun. And then come back and you've got everything set up and you can crack a camp. Another thing people have been asking me is where do I get that billy from, right? This is the last question, I think it is. Where do I get that billy? Because a lot of people have been trying to find it. I think I got that way back in the day at Army Disposals. I'm sure it was Army Disposals. So, yeah. And the frying pan. I'm pretty sure I brought the frying pan from Army Disposals. So it's either Army Disposals or it was Raised Tents. And there was one of them in Ringwood. They were meant to shut shop. I don't know if Raised Tents is still around. But yeah, I'm pretty sure it's one or the other, either one or the other. That's where I got it from. I mean, it's a pretty good billy. It's lasted a very long time, so I can't complain. Well, that's it, guys. So that's pretty much all the Q&A, all the questions that were there. There was a couple of personal ones that I'm, I'm not sort of comfortable with answering those ones. Um, more to do with the bush and what we do here rather than what I do at home. So uh, if there is any other questions, drop a comment and uh, yeah. I'll hopefully answer them in there. Hopefully the sun wasn't in the way of that camera. I just came up and checked. It looked a bit sunny. So if it's not, I'll edit this video. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next one. Stay tuned for this one. Something a bit different about this one. I'll see you there.